can begin, we'll say good morning and welcome to the first meeting in 2022 of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. I would remind members and witnesses all to be concise and to the point in their questioning and answering, because that will be very helpful time-wise, and ask that everyone ensures that their, mobile, their electronic and mobile devices are switched to silent. So I'll turn to Agenda Item 1, which is Audit Scotland's annual report and accounts for the year to 31st March 2022. Uh, it's the only item on the agenda today, uh, along with the auditor's report on these accounts. The members have copies of these, as well as a management letter from Alexander Sloan and their meeting papers. Now, I'm welcoming to the meeting today Alan, Al Alan Alexander, Chair of the Board of uh, Audit Scotland. Um, Professor Alexander is accompanied by Stephen Boyle, the Auditor General for Scotland and the Accountable Officer. Martin Walker, Acting Director of Corporate Services, Audit Scotland, and Stuart Dennis, Corporate Finance Manager, Audit Scotland. Now, I'll ask Professor Alexander first and then the Auditor General to make short introductory statements. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, can I just add my comment to, to Stephen's? It's good to be here in person. Let's hope it continues. Um, over the past year, Scotland's public bodies have had to address the immediate impacts of COVID-19. At the same time, they've had to start the job of rebuilding our communities and economy. And over the past two years, we've, had, we've, we've seen dramatic changes in the way public services are delivered, how citizens com and communities engage with them, and the accompanying sharp rises in public spending. For Audit Scotland, it's been another year of significant development, adaptation, progress and change. For much of the past year, we continued to operate as a virtual organisation. I chaired my first board meeting in person in November of 2021. And we continue to develop how we communicate with each other and with our stakeholders in order to deliver public audit in new ways. Like everybody else, our transition out of the pandemic, I cross my fingers as I say that, and into new ways of working, met, the delay, met with delays and setbacks of infection spikes, new variants, and sometimes the unanticipated re-imposition of restrictions. As always, and I've said this to the Commission before, I've been impressed by the professionalism, commitment and good humour of Audit Scotland staff as they focused on the delivery and development um, despite the uncertainty and volatility of their operating environment. It's been a year of adaptation and development as we continue to deliver audit work remotely, working with uh, public bodies as they deal with the impact of the pandemic on their capacity and resources. We also continue, as you will have seen from our annual report, with uh, the, our change agenda in areas ranging from digital audit to the new code of audit practice to securing the procurement of audit for the next five years. We've also seen changes in our leadership and governance. Uh, Diane McGiffin and Fiona Cord Cordiac, Chief Operating Officer, and Director of the Audit Services Group, respectively. Leaders who have been with Audit Scotland since its inception have left. And I want to put on record today the Board's thanks for all the incredible contributions they've made to both the organisation and, crucially, to public audit. And on the Board itself, Elma Murray has been succeeded as both a Board Member and as Chair of the Accounts Commission by Dr William Moyes. As a Board, we've focused on good governance while providing support uh, to the uh, executive and the staff during the past two, two years. The key component of good governance is to oversee the exercise of all the functions of Audit Scotland. This means centrally ensuring that Audit Scotland effectively supports the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission as they scrutinise public bodies and provide assurance about public spending and the public services that are so vital to us all. I'll now hand over to Stephen as Auditor General and uh, Audit Scotland's Accountable Officer. In doing so, Chair, um, I'd like to thank him publicly for his leadership and vision. He, like me, he came in at um, a, a less than auspicious moment uh, in the um, pandemic 
and his leadership over that period has been exemplary and, and I think anybody you spoke to in the staff would support that view. I also thank there for all those who work at Audit Scotland for what they've done to ensure that we continue to provide high quality, independent and robust public audit at a time when it's never been more important. Chair, thank you. Uh, I'll hand, now hand over uh, to the Auditor General. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks firstly to Alan for his kind words. Chair, during 2021-22, we began to see some of the wider and longer term impacts of the pandemic. We've seen this in the impact on service delivery and demand, and now with backlogs in the NHS and our courts. We've also seen it in the morale and mental health of public workers. Scotland's public spending has increased by more than 25% in a year. And as I reported in my report on the audit of the Scottish Government Consolidated Accounts, in the 2020-21 financial year, Scottish Government spending was £50.1 billion, up from £39.4 billion in the previous year. Billions of pounds, therefore, have moved through the public sector at record pace. And now, as we emerge from the pandemic, Scotland's public bodies must refocus on the pressing issues we face, such as inequalities, climate change and the cost of living. This past year, Audit Scotland has focused on delivering high-quality, independent audit that serves the public interest, while also ensuring we are developing the capacity, skills and structures for what the future holds. 2021-22 was the first year that the full impact of COVID-19 came through our financial audit work. In many ways, this was a more challenging year than 2020-21, as the restraints on the capacity of public bodies became clear. I'm grateful for the work of my colleagues and partner firms who delivered nearly 300 audits and also improved the quality of audit work. During the year, we produced a flexible, responsive and relevant performance audit programme, providing the Parliament and the Accounts Commission and the people of Scotland with in-depth reports, briefings on emerging issues and fast response online publications. This has enabled us to support effective scrutiny in a volatile and dynamic environment. We've also continued to build the resilience of our organisation and our ability to deliver our audit work. Through our annual report, we have examples of the impact of our audit work. It's very important to us that our work benefits the people of Scotland and the outcomes that they have in their lives. As our chair says, at the heart of this is the resilience, professionalism and empathy of my Audit Scotland colleagues. They continue to both support one another and ensure well-being and safety are protected while delivering high quality audit work. Chair, as ever, uh, Ms. Professor Alexander, Martin Stewart and myself will do our utmost to answer the Commission's questions this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you for these opening remarks. Um, maybe I can start off with a couple of uh, straightforward questions. Last time we discussed the budget for Audit Scotland, we talked about COVID-19 impacts and uh, the fact that uh, they didn't seem to be particularly well identified within the books. And of course, Audit Scotland uh, uh, does uh, highlight this with uh, some of the, the organizations that it uh, audits itself. We were promised that we'd see a breakout of COVID-19 figures. Now, unless I'm mistaken someplace in this uh, pile of documents, I, I haven't seen that sort of analysis. Uh, do you have it? Do you have it available? Um, yeah, I'm happy to start on that, Chair, and I'll maybe ask Stuart to say a word or two about kind of how that relates to our uh, reporting. So our annual report and accounts follows a, a prescribed format. In, uh, we follow the... Uh, the frame, the financial reporting manual that sets out our spending. I think in a, in a number of places in our annual reporting accounts, we set out uh, our spending against budget, this analysis of that, and how we've used the, the additional funding. Um, we have supplemented it and can provide the Commission absolutely with more detail on the, the use of the additional funding. Um, and I can pass to Stuart in a moment to, to share some of that uh, verbally, and then you know, as the Commission was, of course, to provide more detail in writing um, as, as you would like. Firstly, at a high level, Chair, we say we've um, used the additional funding that the Commission uh, approved for us to invest in our capacity. We have recruited 
um, additional colleagues, some 46 additional um, auditors. We've invested in our IT and we've invested in um, components of our support services, all of which um, we have kind of detailed records for and um, which are, have flown through the annual report and accounts. Um, as I say, we, Stuart might want to come in and say a bit more, but we can certainly provide the Commission with any further detail that you wish. Spending of the extra money you got, I think it's more COVID-19 and the money from that uh, derived from that and how it was deployed within the within the business. Because like any other business, you receive presumably receive <coughs> furlough pay and all this sort of thing. How was it all dealt with? How much did you receive? Those are the sort of things really what we're looking at, and that's what we discussed last year. I think. Just for clarification, Chair, we, we didn't receive any furlough, I think I should say, as, as a public body. We, that's, we, we were in, funded entirely from the fees and funding uh, approved by the Parliament. Um, I, I, I guess I'm trying to describe is we're somewhat constrained in the format that, that is um, required of us through the annual report and accounts and our ability to, to deviate from how that's set mm -hmm. out. I think what we've tried to do uh, in a number of points through the annual report and accounts is give that both narrative um, and uh, quantitative information about mm. the spending that, that we received. But um, so I think it, I guess we're, we're trying to do both of those things, but recognising that we don't have a, a dedicated page in our annual report and accounts that sets out uh, specifically as, as I think as, as you're suggesting. I think I think the commission last year was interested in just understanding what COVID funds you received, how you deployed them, and how effective it was. That was really what it came down to. Um, I, I recognise that interest and uh, to, to repeat, I think we're very grateful for the support that the Commission provided us to support um, our budget. Um, and I think probably going back to some of the, the conversations from 2020 and, and 2021 is that, that the, um, the investment that the Commission gave us, uh, our discussion, I think we hopefully we were um, relatively clear that that wasn't likely to be a one-year um, change. We've sought to invest that money in both our additional capacity and our audit work, the support functions that all organisations require, and then in particular alongside that, some of the, the changes that we're making through our strategic improvement programme to support some of the digital auditing and, uh, and future focus. So um, we've, if, if memory serves me correct, Chair, I think we, we've... Um, some of our recent correspondence with the Commission has also set out in, in some detail how we've invested that. What probably less clear, I think probably just some of the prescribed formatting arrangements that we have through annual report and accounts doesn't immediately lend itself to, uh, to that in kind of detail. I'm, I'm keen to bring some colleagues in here if, you, if, you, if you're content just to say that. Maybe Stuart and, and perhaps Martin also might want to just to say a bit more detail. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, the, the additional funding in 2021 was required because of the way we operate and we could only recognise a certain amount of fee income and we are expecting a shortfall in that respect. Um, we, we do have a time recording system that had COVID disruption as a code. So that gave us indication of colleagues that um, whether they had COVID or there was um, carrier responsibilities. So we did actually know um, the numbers. I mean, from 2021, it was around 2,600 days were recorded um, as COVID disruption, which equates to broadly about a million pounds. In 21-22, that number reduced to 400 days recorded against that code, um, which is in the region of nearly, nearly 200,000 pounds. But um, so, so we do monitor that. And as the Auditor General said, it, it, it's something that we do as internally as a management accounts, but, but we're quite, um, we do have that information available that we could provide to you in more detail. Could, could, could I maybe just uh, at this point talk about uh, what you've been highlighting? You've got um, work in progress in the accounts of about one and a half million pounds. Now, obviously, that's money you haven't received. So the extra funds that uh, came through last year for you, presumably part of that was used as uh, to, to, to help your cash flow, to bridge that gap between getting that money in. Now, that money will come in, presumably, 
in the not too distant future as you catch up on, on, on where you are. So you'll have a surplus at that point. Presumably that surplus will go back to the Scottish Government's consolidated fund. Leaving aside, of course, if you come forward with another proposal for more money at the end of the year, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that when, when that comes. But presumably for this particular transaction, that will go back to the consolidated fund. Um, in broad terms, yes, Chair, that's correct. But what I might ask is, Stuart, just to explain a bit more detail about the, how our work in progress works. Work in progress is not a, you know, it's not a new feature of Audit Scotland's arrangements. Um, largely attributable to the overlap or crossover between our financial year and then the completion of uh, our audit work and through the audit year. Um, I wonder if you can just pass to Stuart just to kind of talk the Commission through um, in, in, a, in a little bit further detail. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the work in progress, um, like you mentioned there, the 1.5 million, that, that is work that we've done that we haven't build for effectively yet yeah, due to the fee model how we operate that but you're absolutely right there will come a time where um, in 2021 what the issue we had was is that normally in any one year we broadly have a hundred percent in fee income and that works out we have the the balance of the income from finishing the audits from the prior year which is the audits year years broadly work from October through to September and because of COVID and the delays and with the timescales we had to put back, what that meant in 2021 is that we couldn't recognise sufficient income. We weren't going to get the broadly 100%. But you're absolutely right, there will come a point where we're gradually catching up and more of that will come in in the year. And as the Auditor General said, that would come back to the Scottish Consolidated Fund. Well, what I would ask is, at the end of the year, when you're doing your... Uh, your budget calculations again, which you bring forward to the Commission, that you make it absolutely clear uh, how that money is being treated, how much is still needed for cash flow and how much is going back to the consolidated fund. And if you are asking for additional funds at that point, obviously that's something we have to look at as a separate issue. Yeah, very happy to make that commitment, Chair. Thank you. Uh, can I bring Richard Leonard in? Thank you very much indeed. Um, you use the language there, uh, Stuart, of catching up. But when we look at the annual report for uh, 2021 to 22, we see that the number of uh, audits delivered uh, was at 75%. In other words, presumably 25% uh, were not completed. And uh, this time last year, I think the figure was 82%. And I'm reliably informed that pre pandemic uh, you were in and around 100% or the late 90s presumably so is there a tr what's the reason for that why is that um, why does there appear to be on the face of those figures um, not a catching up but a falling back uh, good morning Mr Leonard you're quite right in your assessment of the numbers I think probably what I would take us back to is uh, <clears throat> really the very early stages of the pandemic so in respect of our financial year we um, close our uh, annual reporting accounts at the end of March. So the first year that we reported really only was interrupted by a few weeks um, of, of the pandemic to, to reflect our progress. So as I, as I touched on in my opening remarks, in, in 2021 reflects the full impact, some of the delays the, um, the, of availability of public officials, as, as Stuart's mentioned, some of the disruption that our own colleagues have felt during the course of the pandemic. And um, so that reflects the, the change in level of performance. All of the audits are now completed um, for, for the 2021 uh, year, um, but we still have a catching up period and still have work to do this year to recover some of those timetables. We're focused on doing so, and I think particularly looking uh, into 21-22 Apologies, 22-23, I should say, year, which is the start of the next audit appointment round, where auditors move. We've gone through this, the appointment process and happy to say more about that if the Commission would like. Um, we're keen to do that and recover some of those timescales, but that broadly sets out the, the difference in performance from one year to the next. But um, do you expect to be here in 12 months' time back to 100%? I I would hesitate to give you that commitment. I think for all the reasons we know about the, um, the volatility of the pandemic, that some public bodies are still um, 
looking to recover those timescales for the preparation and production of their accounts and then um, our ab ability to audit that. We have a detailed plan in place. Uh, we are confident that we will recover some of the deadlines that existed before the pandemic. Um, and it's our expectation that 22-23 will look to recover to where we had been. But I think it's, I guess as the last few years have shown us, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious about being definitive at this stage. But again, just so I understand it properly, so the time lags are not just a function of your ability to carry the work out, it's also a function of <coughs> when accounts are prepared by the public bodies that you are auditing. Both those things are relevant factors, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, just moving on to, um, uh, again, I think Professor Alexander spoke about uh, development and, and things being dynamic and moving and so on. Obviously, one of the massive adjustments <coughs> that you've had to make is, is um, uh, moving from a, a, an operation which is office-based and uh, auditing uh, on people's premises, presumably, and so on, to, to a situation where a lot of the work that you carry out is virtual, and including the staffing of your office, uh, which is virtual, I was pleased to visit it just last week and uh, I think that was the first time so many people had been back in the office at any one time. Um, how do you see um, working arrangements uh, going uh, in the future? I mean, do you see um, a return to the pre-pandemic uh, model of operation? Uh, you know, where do you see the balance between people being present in the office and uh, working from different locations? <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm happy to start on that question and turn to Martin in a moment too, who, who can take the, commit, the Commission through some of the detailed thinking that we've been doing um, around this. <clears throat> At a high level, um, even before the pandemic, we didn't have a prescribed um, set of arrangements for colleagues that you must be in the office a certain number of days a week or you must be out a, a public body's audit site. We had a, a, an evolving set of arrangements called time, place, travel that really afforded colleagues more licensed control over you know, where they best did their work. You know, de deploying phrases, work is what you do, not necessarily where you go. Um, pandemic, clearly we had to move overnight, like everyone else, to being a, a virtual organisation. And we've had people back in the office then, out again, as different uh, restrictions came into force over the past couple of years. Our expectation is that we'll continue to operate with a hybrid uh, model, um, that teams, colleagues, um, have the ability to decide for themselves where they need to be and when it matters that people come together at the right points, especially to support um, our colleagues who are newer in the organisation, who go through training, the ability to learn from one another. But a hybrid model, I think, is, is the right setup for us. And, and Martin can take the Commission through in a, in a bit more detail. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Mr. General. We, um, <coughs> we made it what we think is a very successful transition to fully virtual working when we needed to. So overnight on the 16th of March 2020, we went from being an office-based organisation to a virtual organisation. In terms of the impact on us, um, because of the uh, preparations and the IT that we got in place, uh, we think we were able to do that reasonably successfully and really quite smoothly, which meant everybody was able to operate uh, at pretty much full capacity from, from the following day. Um, we supplemented then the arrangements there in that we've got bits of kit out to people that needed them. Um, so whether that be little bits of furniture or, you know, chairs, extra screen, you know, all those kind of things. Um, so from very on, early on in the pandemic, we've kind of demonstrated that it is possible to work in that way. Um, during the course of the pandemic, um, we've had regular uh, communications and engagement with all Audit Scotland staff including a number of surveys that we've done. Uh, we've done specific surveys about people's attitude to hybrid working, what that might mean for them, um, as well as regular pulse surveys, which are essentially a check on, on how, how are people feeling, how is the mood and, and certain other subjects as well. Um, from the most recent survey that we've done, um, it's around about the sort of 75%, 80% mark uh, of people that are saying that typically um, they would be expecting to be in sort of two, three days a week, um, not necessarily on fixed days. Uh, and as Stephen said, very much to do with what work needs to be done and which work is best done in an office and a team-based setting as distinct from perhaps other uh, work where the, there is benefits from, you know, working uh, relatively remote and perhaps to a degree in isolation, you know, getting the head down and getting through stuff. Um, 
we've got a quite significant project underway, um, which is our developing hybrid working project. Um, and we've got colleagues uh, across the organisation involved in that, and we're looking at various aspects um, of what hybrid working will mean for us, uh, what impact that needs to have on our policies and procedures, what the requirements will be on our technology, um, and importantly, what that means for the culture and, and the engagement that there is within the organisation. Um, and that's something that we're, we're working with uh, colleagues, as I say, from across the business in partnership to actually figure out. I think at this stage, we're clear that we don't, we're not 100% clear exactly what hybrid working will mean for us in the future. I think to a degree, we're all working that out as we start it, as people try it. Um, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Leonard, that when the, um, you visited us last week, um, that was one of the busiest days in the office that we'd had. Um, and for me, I think it'll be interesting to see with more people having almost dipped the toe in the water of being back in the office and remembering some of the things that they miss, some of the buzz that they get from engaging with colleagues, uh, things like that, that actually I think we might start to see more of a, an increase, if you like, in terms of office attendance. Um, but it is very much a, a, a kind of work in progress. But, as I say, big project underway with lots of uh, engagement with colleagues just so we can actually figure that out, what it's going to look like in practice. But I, take, I, I take no responsibility for whether people decide they want to come back to work or on seeing me in their office decide they do not. Anyway, Chair, thank you. A point of, of, on, on governance and oversight on this particular topic. The, the board and its two committees, the audit committee and the remuneration and HR committee, uh, take a very close interest on how we perform, particularly the audit committee, but also the remuneration committee because of its responsibility for the well-being of the staff. And we see reports at each of our board meetings and each of our uh, committee meetings on the way the organisation is performing. So... Um, I think the Commission can be assured that we have ways of intervening if we see things are going less well than we would like. And we do that both at the formal level and speaking for myself um, at the informal level through uh, regular monthly meetings, in my case with the uh, Auditor General and with the... Uh, chief Operating Officer and in the absence of a Chief Operating Officer over the last six months or so with, uh, with Martin. So I think it, it, the, the Commission needs, can be assured that both in terms of the management of the money and the governance of the money, um, we're on the case. And, you know, I can tell you that my board is quite incisive, particularly uh, you'll be delighted to learn the independent members of the board if things begin to go awry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just continuing the questioning, maybe I can bring Daniel Johnson in at this point. Not as successful as we'd hoped. <laughs> Perhaps while we sort that technical problem out, we'll move, we'll move on to, to Mark Ruskell. Yeah, thanks. Um, you, you, both yourself, Alan, and, and yourself, Stephen, have mentioned the importance of well-being uh, amongst staff. And I think you said, Stephen, about you know, empathy, resilience, I mean, all, all strong values. Um, but I'm just trying to contrast that with, with quite a stark figure, which is the, the level of staff turnover, which I think has gone up from 5.1% to 9.4% the last year. And I, I'm just sort of wondering, does that, is that a bit of a red light for you? And, and what's the story underneath that um, turnover? What, what are the themes that are coming out of the exit interviews with staff? Are there underlying issues around... You know the destination of people within the industry, where they where they want to go next. Are there, I, I'm I'm trying to second guess what those issues are. Is it a natural um, consequence of COVID that people have you know are now thinking about the next position in their careers? I I, I don't know. It's tempting to look at a figure like that, and it can ring alarm bells. 
What, what's the story behind that? Because on the face of it, you're losing people. Yeah. Um, uh, good morning, Mr. Ruskell. I'll start. Actually, Martin will have a, a perspective on this, and perhaps Alan as well. Um, the turnover has increased, actually, but it, it's, it's one of the metrics that, with which we use to evaluate <coughs> colleague well-being and so forth, which we've emphasised repeatedly. Not, I mean, we talk about it as if it's just been the pandemic. I think it's, it's, it's an organisation of value that I would recognise, having worked in Audit Scotland, <coughs> you know, for over 15 years uh, at various intervals. Um, we we survey our colleagues regularly. Martin mentioned Pulse surveys. Um, and also our annual Best Companies survey. We've retained our status as a one-star organisation um, for which we achieved last year and hung on to that. <clears throat> but it's not entirely a positive story, actually. I think we would recognise in some of the feedback that colleagues have given us that they are under pressure. They have, you know, that the, the, is a factor of delivering in a virtual or hybrid setting. Um, it doesn't suit everybody. It doesn't suit, you know, everyone with necessarily with caring responsibilities. There is, a, um, as everybody will have felt during the pandemic, some sense of isolation at various points, mental health challenges for, for public workers, and some of our colleagues have, um, have absolutely felt that. We do have support ar arrangements around that. In terms of the turnover specifically, um, there are various factors. Some relate to the, um, the points I've, I just touched on. Another relate to you know, what the market is like. It's a very competitive market that we operate in um, for, for, for audit skills, um, not, not just at kind of the traditional entry points for, for trainees, but really throughout the grades and also for support staff as well. We, you know, there's a, an example in our organisation. You know, we are very focused on digital auditing, digital security. These skills are really hot. They are in demand for, for all organisations and trying to compete against that um, are a number of the factors as to why uh, people have left. So yes, our turnover has increased. We're keeping a close eye on it. We do conduct exit interviews um, with people for, to explore the reasons um, why they have left Audit Scotland, um, and we're tracking it really uh, uh, carefully. I think the one other factor to say that um, is that we have increased our organisation, so we are still um, in there. We are able to recruit and, and attract skills into the organisation but um, and so we're certainly not complacent about it but one we're just keeping a close eye on um, as as we have been monitor the some of the reasons and stats by <coughs> just check with martin's anyone to add um, just just one or two other points if i may um one is that the one thing to bear in mind in this is the the kind of baseline that we're comparing it to so you're absolutely right the 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 turnover has increased but it, it's increased from what has been for us and compared to other organisations, a very, very low turnover previously. Um, so it is the case that it, it, has, uh, it has gone up, but it's from a very kind of low, low starting point. So that, that's one factor. Um, as Stephen says, we, we do an exit interview for everybody that leaves the organisation to understand the reasons for it and whether there are push factors, pull factors from elsewhere. Um, we're not seeing a particular trend. I think all of the factors that, that Stephen mentioned are part of the story. Um, and I think another, another part of that story as well is, is that for some people, um, they've simply been reaching that age when they've decided to retire. Um, and, you know, a few people have moved on um, and just moved into retirement over the course of the recent year or so. Um, and I think partly for that, you know, COVID has been a factor in that we've seen in other places, and there's been plenty of articles about this, people perhaps reevaluate what they want from life. And if they're reaching that stage where, yeah, I can do a couple more years or maybe just leave that bit early, I think that's been a, a factor in there as well. <clears throat> from the analysis that we've done, um, there isn't anything kind of that's, that's starting to, you know, flash big warning lights to say, you know, we've got, we're going to have an exodus on our hands or anything like that. But as Stephen says, it is something that we keep a very close eye on just to make sure that we, we're tracking all of that. Yeah. Yeah, can I just add to that? The, the, the point that, the point that um, Martin makes, I think, is really important that you, you take a figure like that and you unpack it because there are leavers and there are those who retire. And just to emphasise that, Audit Scotland an organ, as an organisation has existed now for just over 21 years. Now, if you think about that in terms of senior staff, um, if you get in a new organisation 20 years out of your senior staff, you're doing very well. But it does mean that there's going to be quite a few who go over a fairly short 
period and, in, and certainly over uh, this, the, the year to which this report refers, we had a little bunch of these that came up, some half expected, some not expected at all in terms of retirement, and some um, of people who took up an opportunity that they didn't see coming. But I must emphasise the point that um, Martin made, that this is a figure that I always look at too, but nothing uh, flashes red to me in that. Uh, amber, maybe, you know, just to keep an eye on it. But I think the Commission can be assured that that in itself, uh, that turnover, has not affected the performance of Audit Scotland. OK, I think that was useful to unpack that, and I'm, I'm much more reassured now. Um, you mentioned about the st staff surveys and the pulse surveys and the more the more sort of wider annual surveys i mean one one thing that's come out of this is a is a kind of you know we noticed a series of graphs that compare yourselves to um to other appointed firms and i suppose that you know whether whether it's easy to draw an exact equivalence there i suppose is is debatable but you know on on, on the face of it um staff in all of those firms uh, including yourselves saying they all feel relatively you know encouraged well encouraged well supported to do their work um but there does seem to be a bit of a gap between audit scotland and the appointed firms in terms of the uh, the resources um that um that that you have and also training and, and development appears to be um, a gap where it's, there's a noticeable gap between what staff at audit scotland are saying and what staff at the appointed firms are saying the appointed firms seem to be more satisfied on those two areas. So I wonder what your, your response is, is to that, because, again, it, it, it kind of it flashes an amber to red, maybe. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I'm happy to start, actually, and I will ask Martin said a word or two. I think in our, in our accompanying report, the quality of public audit in Scotland, I think, sets out some of the detail um, behind the views of colleagues in Audit Scotland about uh, the, how they are encouraged to undertake quality audit work and the extent to which they have the resources uh, to do so. And, uh, and you're right, Mr. Ruskell, we set out how that compares with the audit firms that, that are appointed on behalf of myself and the Accounts Commission uh, to do likewise. There's, there's a triangulation, I think it's there's a consistency both within uh, the quality survey and also the annual survey that colleagues are telling us that they have felt under pressure to deliver quality um, audit work. Uh, during the course of the year, and the availability of resources is one of the components around that. Over the course of the past two years, we've tried to be very consistent that um, quality and well-being um, sit as um, higher priorities than that of delivering deadlines. Um, what is always rubs up against that is <clears throat> people's desire to deliver a um, high-quality audit work to meet their deadlines and that sense I think we, we've used the word um, from time to time but a snowplow effect that colleagues are keen to move on to the next audit year recognising that um, other deadlines and deliverables um, will be upon them. Um, to tackle the resources um, issue we're hugely grateful for the investment that the Commission has supported Audit Scotland in, in, <clears throat> in our work and that has made a difference no doubt. Um, what we're now looking at Building on some of the work that maybe turn to Martin to, to update the Commission on is our one organisational working, how we can flex our resourcing model um, to give us a bit more <clears throat> organisational control, flexibility, and that colleagues feel that. And we anticipate that will make a significant difference over the course of uh, these 12 months. Um, and But we'll test that again, uh, as you would expect, with colleagues through, through next year's survey. But Martin, are you able to say some more? Yep, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, th th this is an interesting one. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, you know, seeing the, the data on that is something that we pay close attention to. Um, there's an interesting thing going on there where um, for some colleagues, um, their, how they feel and their sense of achievement is sometimes driven by hitting the deadlines. Um, and actually, if there is delay to the audit work, they feel personally, it's nothing to do with what you know, senior managers may be saying, but they feel personally that they're perhaps not quite achieving in the way that they might like. And at exactly the same time, you could have other people in that same team who are actually feeling the pressure of trying to hit that deadline and perhaps will be comfortable if 
it, it, it was kind of delayed and, and so you get an, <clears throat> a, a kind of situation though where it can feel stressful but in very different ways for, for people in the teams. Um, as Stephen said, the, the investment um, has been very welcome and, and we did prioritise audit capacity um, at the, the front end <coughs> excuse me, of our building capacity project. Um, and I think one of the factors of this year um, is that when we do get that additional capacity in there, it doesn't become 100% productive at the point of entry. Of course, there's the leading time in terms of recruitment, selection, notice periods, uh, and then quite an extensive onboarding process that we have as well. So it's great that we've got these additional people in here, but with the best will in the world, but are not able to contribute at full capacity, if you like, um, over the course of that period. So we, we're quite optimistic that that lag effect, if you like, that you get when introducing new capacity should start to even things out a little bit in the year to come. Um, the other thing I, I would say as well is that in terms of hitting those deadlines, uh, and you picked up on this earlier on, Mr Leonard, as well, is that for, for some of the sectors, um, we still, I think, delivered really well. So 100% of the NHO, NHS audits were delivered to deadline. 82% of the uh, local government audits were, were, were to deadline. Unfortunately, we weren't able to achieve that, those same kind of rates in, in necessarily all of the sectors. Um, so it can kind of vary from, from team to team a little bit on that. Um, on the one organisational working um, point that, that, that Stephen raised, we've, we've got a project underway there. And essentially what that is about is about trying to ensure that we can use the resources that we've got perhaps more flexible than we might have had done in the past. So we have, as you would imagine, you know, organisational structures in terms of super teams and teams that are dedicated to particular audits. Um, but what we're trying to work out now is what are the barriers that prevent us from actually just moving people across to a particular audit on the basis of the need in that audit, perhaps on the basis of the skills that are needed for that particular audit, and how we can make that work more effectively so that we're getting the best out of everybody in the organisation. The other thing that I think that that project will be really helpful for as well is that we do know from the staff survey that there are some colleagues feel that they've got some skills that they have got that perhaps aren't being utilised to best effect. And again, that can sometimes be an, almost an accident of allocation in terms of the work that they're on. Um, so we, we, we're hoping that through this project we'll be able to kind of square that off as well so that actually the people are getting the best experience and are feeling that they're able to develop through by through that more deployment, sorry, through the deployment being more flexible and equally from an organisational point of view, we would feel the benefit of that as well. So potentially if we can get that stuff right, it will be a real win-win. Yeah, yeah. Chair, can I just note that the question that Mr Russell asked throws a very interesting light on one of the strengths of the Scottish Public Audit Model, and that is that two-thirds of the audits are done by Audit Scotland and one-third by the firms which allows us to make that continuous comparison, and not only on price, but on quality, on the way, the way staff perceive what they're doing. And I've spent the last two years um, chairing the steering group, which oversaw the procurement of the next five years of audit from external firms. And if I wasn't convinced at the beginning of that process that this was the right, the right balance, uh, I was certainly convinced at the end of it, because it, it means that we are not in an Audit Scotland bubble. We are continuously able to measure our performance against uh, the, the private sector firms. Can I just, um... just very briefly, um, this may seem counterintuitive, but would a, would a four-day week benefit your organisation? Because obviously where four-day week has been implemented, <coughs> The majority of cases, it's improved productivity. You may be at a point where you don't think productivity can increase anymore. But if you're talking about staff wanting to reutilize their skills, move more flexibly around the organization, there, there would be some opportunities there. But I, I wonder if that's something that's been looked at within the context that you're in. So, um, we're aware of it. We're looking at it in a, in a couple of factors. One is, I think, like many organizations, we're following uh, closely and awaiting the results of the national pilot uh, for four-day week working that's taken place across uh, public uh, and private sector organisations. Um, 
is something that we are also engaging in discussion with our staff representatives um, as well to, as they are uh, enthusiastic for us to have that debate and we'll do that over the course of, of the year ahead. Um, in terms of the terms and conditions that we offer there are, I think as I was saying to Mr Leonard last week actually, we have many, many colleagues who don't operate a standard uh, five-day, Monday, uh, Monday to Friday uh, working pattern. Uh, so we offer compressed hours, we offer part-term working arrangements to give that flexibility to our colleagues. And we think, and it, I think perhaps going back to your earlier point about, about turnover, um, the, we can't necessarily always compete on pay alone. Um, and so that we have to have a, an offer to existing and prospective employees and the flexibility in our terms and conditions is absolutely one of those uh, points that we look to provide people. Um, whether that then translates into a four day week, I think it's something that I think we'll, we'll take a, a right interest in, but keen to have that conversation over the course of the year ahead and see what the pilot results say. Thank you. Kevin. Thanks so much. Um, I think we've got Daniel Johnson back on board now. Daniel? Second time lucky. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Terrific. Um, uh, so just really following on from, from some of the comments that have already been raised, primarily from Richard Leonard, um, who, who, who uh, raised the, the point around uh, delays. There's also the point in uh, your annual report uh, which states uh, that, that uh, around 36% of your audits are not meeting uh, expected standards. Uh, I understand that, that you target 80%. So I was just wondering if uh, you could provide an explanation as to why it's 36% uh, and indeed uh, how and when you expect to meet the 80% uh, standard. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Johnson. I think um, I'm grateful for the, for the question. Actually, and we've um, in our report, on a company report, down in report and accounts, the quality of public audit in Scotland. Um, we set out the results of the external and internal assessment of our audit quality. So um, this report reflects the arrangement that we have with the Institute of Chartered Accountants for Scotland who have done some of that external assessment. Um, you're quite right and you say that 36% of those audits that were assessed didn't meet the, the expected quality standards. In itself that matters. We want all of our audits, we have a target of 80% on a cumulative three-year rolling basis to meet the, um, the standards um, for auditing standards, accounting standards and our overall arrangements. Um, we're, on a, we're in the middle of a process, I would say, to, to assure the Commission. So last year, the Commission may recall, is that um, we had a, some disappointing results in our financial um, audit um, assessments where 36% didn't, 36% uh, met the standard. We're now up at 64%. And that reflects um, a really focused level of activity over the course of the past 12 months. Um, we've invested in uh, quality work. We've had very consistent quality messages. I touched on a, a moment or two ago about quality and well-being over delivery. Um, we've created a, a more extensive programme of what we call cold reviews um, and hot reviews. Cold reviews being after the fact. Hot review are potential interventionist reviews that allow audit teams to amend their approach, undertake additional work. Um, so we're we are pleased to see the progress that we are making. Um, some of it, I think, is a bit of a, will reflect what we anticipate will be a time lag effect, that we, we received the results and the detailed feedback from, um, from ICAS and from our internal code reviews. By the time we get that, some of our audits are almost at the point of completion. So our ability to share the learning and the good practice from that can't quite always necessarily be captured before an audit is completed. Part of that explains, I think, where we'll get to anticipating uh, a stronger set of results next year as we uh, incorporate all the learning um, from last year. And also, the, the point we'd also look to uh, reassure the Commission is that audit quality is fundamental to Audit Scotland. It's the, it's the bedrock of our work, our, the reliability of it, and our reputation. Um, and we're also just refocusing some of our, um, our structure to best capture that. We've in previous years had what we called a, a professional support team that does much of the technical support to auditors. 
um, alongside some of the quality uh, assessment. Um, that's been done in some respects alongside other responsibilities, but we felt that that wasn't necessarily giving us the right platform, the right level of the resource, the right focus um, on quality. And um, so we've, in the past few months, looking to move that on to what we're calling to an innovation and quality team, giving us some dedicated resource to further embed quality or compliance and the impact of our work. And so we're pleased with the progress. We're not complacent um, and expect that over the course of this year that that compliance uh, with quality standards will increase further still. So could I just push you a, a little bit uh, further? I mean, I, I note those activities. Um, so you're saying that you expect to see improvement. So if we're sitting here this time next year, do you have a, an anticipated number that you expect it? And likewise, when do you expect to meet the 80% standard? Uh, will that be this time next year or will that be in following years? Um, so the, the standard is a rolling or cumulative three-year target of, of 80% of our audits will meet the, uh, just for clarity if it's helpful, the FRC um, external quality assessment standard, which is a score of one to four. So our audits um, scoring would reflect that. Um, it's my expectation really that all of our audits are of a high quality um, and meet those standards and that's the so we'd, we would never set out giving any message that well you know we want to live with 20 percent that don't meet the standard or or 64 percent uh, compliance in, in the year in question um, we're confident that the investment that we're making in uh, quality building on the work over the past few years capturing that alongside our development and methodologies the training that we provide our people will get us to 80% and, and really beyond that. I mean, I don't think, that, just to, to reassure the Commission is that we don't want to operate in a, in a point where we've got you know, a fifth of our audits are, aren't, operate, aren't operating at the expected standards. So it's my expectation that um, we'll see progress in the year ahead. Um, and, you know, and, and if that comes off as anticipated, that we'll have a level of compliance consistent um, with our target. The only caveat that I would make, uh, Mr Johnson, is that um, the standards are changing and growing, and that's right. So we've got new um, international standards and auditing that apply for the year ahead. Um, we're investing in training and development to support colleagues apply those properly. Um, but it's something that all auditors across public and private sector uh, will be dealing with. So, that, so I allow for the possibility that there may be a bedding in period, um, but, uh, but that shouldn't... Uh, differentiate from the message I'm giving that we are really taking quality seriously and expect to see further progress in the year ahead. Thank you. Uh, are you finished, Daniel? I, I, I think so. Unless any other members of the panel, in particular, if there's been any uh, you know, activity from the, the, the audit committee themselves to, to oversee this, I, I'd be interested just to Perhaps understand I could, what the discussions I, I could, have been. Perhaps I could help on that, Chair. Um, uh, my, my approach to being Chair of the Board of Audit Scotland and my relationships with the senior staff is to insist on a no surprises uh, relationship. If anything's going wrong, I want to know as soon as possible. And I knew very early uh, about the dip in quality that we've talked about um, before the, the Commission uh, before. And we now have um, a process whereby progress on quality is monitored not only at the board, but crucially at the audit committee. Uh, that is chaired by Colin Crosby, who has great experience in this field. And he also sits, as, sits in as an observer on the Audit Quality Committee of um, Audit Scotland. So if the board needed to know uh, that um, we were not making the kind of progress to which the Auditor General has referred, then we would know very quickly, informally, and that would then formally be considered first by the Audit Committee and uh, by the Board. I think our arrangements for that kind of oversight are very robust indeed, and the Auditor General as Accountable Officer has been uh, robust in making sure that both the committees and uh, the Board themselves are involved in the oversight of this. So if there was any falling back from the progress to which Stephen has referred, um, we would, if I can use 
an old phrase, we'd be all over it. Um, but I think we've got the right mechanisms in place. And we would hope to uh, report the results of that to you uh, this day next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Daniel, that, anything you want to add? No. In that case, uh, I'll ask Sharon Burney to come in. Thank you. Hi there. Um, just continuing the theme of wellbeing for staff, on page 77, Audit Scotland included a provision of £1.053 million to cover the cost of unused annual leave. It was just to see some of the reasons behind why staff wouldn't take their annual leave. And I know that the Auditor General had said about staff's desire to meet deadlines and produce high quality work. So that might have been a, everything was locked down, you couldn't go on holiday anyway. So I'll just stay and complete my audits. But it's just to see why why they hadn't taken holidays and what we've put in for this year to make sure that we're encouraging staff and supporting them to take their holidays. Yeah, good afternoon, Ms. Dewey. It's a really important point. Actually, we want um, all of our colleagues to use all of their annual leave every year. You know, there are always factors as to you know, why that isn't the case from people's uh, domestic personal arrangements that you know, can, uh, can hamper that. Um, what we have seen, though, through the course of the pandemic is that unused annual leave balances in Audit Scotland have increased. And I think partly for the reasons that you suggest about uncertainty around restrictions, um, places people can and then couldn't go on holiday, and then inability to make alternative arrangements at short notice. These have all have been factors. But it is also the case, and I think as we touched on already, and, and as Martin mentioned, that um, because some of that uh, uncertainty has also fed through to the work environment, you know, about the uh, availability of resources, the uncertainty about the timing as to when audits would start and complete, and people's desire to complete um, deliverables, not to have them you know, snow ploughed up and overlapping with uh, successive years. All of these have been factors. I mean, I would think it's also fair to say is that we've delivered an ambitious programme of public reporting, performance and, and best value audits. We've talked about mentioned in my introductory remarks about a dynamic programme. So we've sought to have a regular, impactful public audit commentary during the course of the pandemic, all of which has um, placed demands upon our colleagues. Actually, as we are through that, we're evaluating our uh, future programme of public reporting to move to not necessarily pre-pandemic um, style, but one that's more sustainable um, model. Um, and we're also sending out just a clear communication and, and messaging is that we expect people to take their holidays. We want them to take their holidays. Um, it's all about the, um, the, you know, the offer that we make as an employer. You know, we, we have a, a, our culture isn't one that we um, would recognise from some parts um, of the private sector of excessively long hours. We want people to have an appropriate work and life balance, and all of that means uh, taking their annual leave. So um, please be assured we are, we are sending clear communication to colleagues um, about that. Um, we do have limits on the, the amount of annual leave that people can carry forward. Our, our holiday year um, has a cut-off date, and line managers have detailed conversation with colleagues where there's a pattern from one year to the next of, of regular um, unused leave, but it's a clear focus for us in the year ahead. Thank you. And just the next one is, there was issues that were uh, highlighted in Police Scotland and in the Fire Brigade with people taking early retirement. Um, and I just noticed that you've got the voluntary early release. In page 47, it does say that there's only one member of staff left under a voluntary early release arrangement where they were entitled to early access to their pension. So obviously we're talking about issues with recruitment and concerns. So I was just wondering if you could tell us more about the scheme and is it still in place? Yeah, happy to start on that. And Martin might want to say a word or two uh, more. Um, in terms of the, the disclosures we have in our accounts, so this was a, a voluntary um, early release um, from, and that's really open to uh, any member of staff um, at particular points in their career if they want to um, engage in it. Sometimes we have a more formal you know, process. We, we, I think it's probably now six or seven years since we've had an active promoted um, early release, release scheme. That's not been the, the circumstances that we're in um, as an organisation at the moment. 
And when somebody does look, look to engage that, whether it's the circumstances that they're in, we'll look sympathetically to individuals' um, uh, requests and, and explanations of why that's uh, the right thing for them and you know, in their, their phase of their career, and that was the, what related to this year. Where that happens, somebody can access their pension. Um, it results in you know, contractual uh, flow through to us as an organisation. I'll, I'll pause and just turn to Martin, I think more he wants to say. Yeah, I think um, probably th there's an important distinction to make between having a voluntary er early release scheme and receiving a voluntary early release request. Um, and as Stephen says, um, I do recall, yeah, maybe six, seven years ago, uh, where we were at a stage to, to look, perhaps uh, downsize the organisation a little bit. We would uh, create uh, a VERA, as we, t you know, typical acronym in many organisations, a VERA scheme um, that would identify certain criteria um, and people that therefore fell into those criteria could make an application under a kind of broad invite, if you like. Um, we've not done one of those for, for many years now because we've actually been in a situation where we're either sustaining or looking to increase capacity. Um, and for this year, it was simply a request from the individual uh, rather than being under a part of a specific scheme. Right, that's fine. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one or two final questions, as you might expect. Um, the cost of remote audit you've highlighted is 25% more expensive. To what extent can you recover any of that uh, money from those being audited? And to what extent is that being written off against the additional resources, uh, budget resources that were uh, allocated to you by the government? Yeah, thank, thanks for, for raising this, uh, Chair. It's, a, it's an important, it's been a real factor in the, you know, the, yes, the cost of delivering remote audit, but also the quality, which I think we've touched on um, already this morning. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask Stuart, because there's a couple of relevant transactions that are in our accounts that um, related to provisions that we had in last year's accounts about the cost of remote audit. And then um, one of the other factors that's relevant for our fee arrangements is the travel and subsistence that auditors would typically have done, in which our fee model is based. And then the, the, the fact that that has reduced considerably over the course of the pandemic and what that also means for our fees um, and potential reflection as we are... Um, as we would reflect the legislation that, as to what our fee model entails. Um, so I'm going to just invite Stuart to talk. Sorry. So Stuart answers the, the full thing. Yeah. Now that you've mentioned that, if, if you state in here that remote audit costs 25% more, that doesn't imply that it's a sort of netted off figure if you take into account uh, discounting off the travel and all the rest of it. I assume that 25% is an absolute figure after taking everything into account. Yeah, that, and, and it reflects a period, um, probably the volatility of it. So the, the 25%, um, we would have seen very clearly in last year's accounts and the, and the impact of um, the preparation, as we've touched on, of public bodies, our, our auditors' own arrangements, um, and receiving evidence remotely, testing that against quality standards. So all of that would be... But, but it is a net figure, that 25%. So I, if, you, if I may just ask, I don't want to uh, uh, unwittingly give the, the wrong answer to the Commission, so I'll maybe just check with Stuart that okay. uh, that number is, uh, as you suggest, here. The 25% from last year was, was the indication of the extra time it takes to do the remote audit. So um, normally we plan um, to do audits in a certain number of, of days, audit days. And, and what happened is, is that last year, um, when we had to complete the 1920 audits in the 2021 financial year, it was broadly speaking, it worked out that it was that extra time required to do the audits was in that, that region. Um, so, so in effect, what happened last year was, as you'll see from the accounts and, and the Auditor General mentioned, is that we, uh, the firms that do audit work um, said that the actual costs that they incurred was more through doing the audit work remotely, and we put a provision in the accounts to cover that. What then happened is, is that when we got the information and negotiated with them 
in the 21-22 financial year, we managed to work out a figure that was less and settle for a less figure with them. So, so in effect, whilst it might have taken 25% more time to do some audits, not all of them were like that. It really depended, and I think was mentioned earlier, depended on the this, the quality of the papers you had and um, and from the bodies we're auditing as well as the time that we needed to do that. So in, in effect, the 25% is a net figure that, that you mentioned. So just to be clear, that 25% additional cost is after taking into account uh, the savings on travel and so forth against the additional time taken to no, carry out the audit. It is purely that is the additional time. Um, the additional additional time. time. So we have then saved in travel, and the firms have saved in expenses. That so, whilst we're saying it takes longer to do the audit, we have saved in those specific areas. So it's areas, not actually a final figure. No, no, that, that's not entirely clear it, in the it, accounts. It, the looking at looking at still looking at the uh, additional costs and so on. Uh, is there any part can be recovered from the organisation being audited and is the anticipation that uh, it, that, uh, that figure, that 25% less whatever, will be written off against uh, the budget support given by the Scottish Government? Um, uh, I'm happy to answer that. The 25% the, the was specifically in the 19 in the 2021 financial year that was the year when covid hit and we then put that provision in the accounts to cover that um, in the audit year 2021 any remote costs were to be charged to the audited body and that was the arrangement that we we had so in 21 22 financial year but 20 20 21 audit year we would recover any additional work we needed to do because of remote. These additional costs go against the additional budget that was granted by the Scottish Government. Good. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, obviously, there's been there's some of the budgeted expenditure is a bit higher. Staff recruitment costs, we've talked about staff recruitment. One of the things that I look at when I look at Audit Scotland, there, there's, there's several different factors here that if you were looking at an organisation might cause concern. Firstly, you lose most of your senior staff. Secondly, your staff turnover is substantially higher. And third, a, stab, a substantially additional number of trainees is taken on board. Is there anything in there that should cause us concern? Right. I don't think so, Chair. Actually, I think it's, uh, and Professor Alexander might want to say a little bit more about the, the points that you raise. Um, yes, there's been turnover at senior staff levels very clearly after a, a long period of, um, of stable leadership. Um, I, I'm trying not to read too much into that, Chair, as a, and I think as, in terms of my own appointment as, as Auditor General. But, but realistically, I think there's um, there are a variety of, of different factors behind it. So the, the commission will be familiar with the fact that we've had turnover at chief operating officer level, um, where the former chief operating officer is now a chief executive of a, a high-profile organisation in Scotland. We've had um, a retiral from uh, our executive team as well. Um, and I think those factors are all individual um, recruitment costs reflect the fact that we have gone out to the market to secure new executive team, executive team posts um, and have had a very strong, successful campaign. Is it only the these uh, three posts that uh, represent the overspend of 97,000 in the budget? So there's also factors about... So we've, and also, I think, as we mentioned uh, a few moments ago, we have recruited to increase our organisational capacity. Mm. So uh, across a variety of posts and campaigns to bring capacity into our audit uh, services and our PABV organisations firstly, 
and then into parts of our corporate services. So the volume of recruitment that we've undertaken um, is part of the component behind our spending of recruitment costs. The turnover, we, I think we've mentioned, and you're, it's a perfectly reasonable challenge, Chair, that you know, uh, are these um, alarm bells. As Martin mentioned, we analyse carefully the factors behind individual levers in the organisation. Some of it's due to the senior staff that we've mentioned, people taking life choices to exercise their uh, ability to retire earlier than they might have done as a result of experiences they've had during the course of the pandemic. And then also, I think it is safe to say um, that it is a competitive, challenging market that we're operating in, that um, not just ourselves, but all audit firms, and that, and that largely is the market that we're competing against, are experiencing challenges in recruiting, retract, uh, attracting talent into the profession, and then retaining uh, once they do so. Um, so we're not complacent, but I think it is safe to say we're, we're keeping a really careful eye on some of these metrics as indicative of, of organisational health. Um, Alan, you might want to say a bit more about that. Can I invite the Commission just to imagine for a moment that the, the pandemic didn't happen? Um, had that not happened, Stephen would just still have become Auditor General and uh, Accountable Officer on the 1st of July of 2020. And I think, I, uh, I hope I don't misrepresent him when I say that he would have wanted to move to change some of the management structure of, Scot of, of uh, Audit Scotland. He and I talked about this very early on, and I think you won't be surprised to learn that once we brought the pandemic back into consideration, uh, neither of us thought that it would be a good idea to do that kind of major restructure while we were dealing with all the other things that the pandemic um, brought to us. What we didn't know at that point was that there would be opportunity to make other changes. Uh, the departure of the Chief uh, Operating Officer, the retiral of the Director of the Audit Services Group, gave uh, Stephen the opportunity to come to me, first of all, and then to the Board with his proposals for how to reconfigure the top structure. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the uh, board, and in particular, um, Chair, the non-execs, were really quite um, fierce in their examination of what Stephen wanted to do. Uh, and in fact, I think it's fair to say, Stephen, that some, some tweaks were made to what was being proposed, which, had, which in the end improved the um, proposal that the board uh, agreed because these were posts uh, that in terms of their uh, membership of the, what was used to be called the management team, which is now called the executive team, they, these appointments are in the gift of the board. Therefore, we had to be involved straight through. We're also involved in the process of, of recruitment in terms of interview uh, and shortlisting, longlisting and so on. Now, all of that, um, we felt, had to be done carefully to the highest possible recruitment standards um, because um, we all took the view that this was, uh, this was a once in a decade probably opportunity to, recon to reconfigure. And that was always going to be, I think, um, an expensive process because we, we've mentioned a couple of times this morning that this is an incredibly tight employment market it was important, therefore, that we, we got assistance in identifying people who might want to talk to us about working uh, for Audit Scotland. It was a, a, a long, a very detailed process over a period of, I suppose, even four months um, between February and May, and we think we now have the right team. I don't think we would have got to that stage without the investment that's, that's um, recorded in the accounts. I hope that's helpful, Chair. Just one last question on, on, on staffing. Um, you've got uh, perhaps a record number of trainees now. What's your retention level on trainees? Yeah, I'll maybe turn to Martin. I can, I'll, Martin, give the detail on, on retention level. Um, just by way of context, Chair, to say that trainees um, is, is the traditional largest entry point um, into Audit Scotland. So, you know, people 
typically join us as graduate trainees, although in recent years we also have um, entry points for school leavers into the organisation as well uh, for those that can also embark upon uh, studies towards a, a professional accountancy qualification straight from school. Um, that's been a real success for us um, as well. And we're now operating around 50, 51 trainees at various stages of, uh, of qualification. Um, not to use a cliche, but it's the lifeblood and it's the, it, it allows us to uh, do a number of things as well as to you know, secure high quality, motivated, able people to come in and, and uh, deliver our audit work. It also helps us address some of the more sticky, long-standing issues about gender equality, ethnicity equality in the organisation as well. We are more diverse at our trainee um, uh, cohort of colleagues than we are at other parts of the organisation. And building on that success, we expect we'll see us to be a more diverse organisation in the years to come as well. But um, Martin might want to say some more. Yes, thank you. Um, so... Probably one of the biggest um, public sector schemes in terms of our trainee scheme. It's one of the largest in, in this kind of field. Um, and as Stephen said, 51 trainees currently on, on that scheme. 78% um, of folks in the year 21-22 chose to stay with Audit Scotland, having qualified on the scheme. Um, and funnily enough, just at the executive team a couple of weeks ago, actually, we, we considered a report from some colleagues that was actually a kind of 10-year review of the scheme. Um, so that was a kind of big step back to see, OK, let's have a look at the scheme, how successful it's been, what people who've been on the scheme think of it, what they've been telling us, what the retention rates are, all that kind of stuff. So quite a, quite a substantial piece of work. Um, and from that, um, we established that since 2011... Um, we've had over 140 um, trainees been on that scheme um, and 77% of those that qualified stayed with Audit Scotland. So virtually identical to the, the annual rate that we can report for, the, for this year. Um, so we consider, as Steve said, a very, very important part of how we get talent into the organisation. Um, and, and just to, to reinforce the point about kind of widening access as well, uh, part of that review report that I just mentioned uh, was also uh, seeking executive team approval to start exploring options around perhaps uh, entrance from college, uh, Mond Apprentice routes in, um, so that we're actually able to provide more opportunities to a, a, a wider uh, diversity of people. Um, and I'm sure that will be a thing that, that will be beneficial both to those people entering the scheme and undoubtedly for us as an organisation as well. Thank you. And really just one last question here. Um, part of your IT costs have been increased licences. Don't you bulk buy licences or do you have to buy them individually for these additional staff? Uh, I'll, I'll turn to Martin to see if we, if we have that, that information. Chair, part of the increased cost is the fact that we have more colleagues um, this year than, than we have done. And so it's also, is, and there's been a, a a general increase in IT costs, really um, building on last year's annual report and accounts where we've, the fact that we are operating in a hybrid setting meant that we've had to buy incidentals to, just to support people to work both at home um, and um, in the office and also out on site. In terms of the IT licence, if we have that information, um, we can share it just now through Martin. If not, we'll come back in writing. Yeah, I could say a little bit more about that if it's helpful, Chair. Um, so... I suppose it, it kind of depends on the licence that we talked about because all licences aren't equal and, of course, it depends on what's the licence for what kind of system we're actually talking about. The, the bulk of, of the licences are for the kinds of products that everybody, every, all of us use um, and the arrangement that we have for the majority of those licences is actually we've got a very flexible arrangement which means we can dial it up and down in exactly the way that we need. Um, and actually that, we think, provides better value for money than bulk buying and then ending up with 20, 30, 40 licences sat on the shelf that aren't being used. Um, so literally we're able to kind of flex um, our licensing and therefore, you know, we, we pay on the basis of need um, rather than having, yeah, like I say, surplus licences around. But it absolutely is something that we, we uh, pay very close attention to. And indeed, it's one of the areas that we actually get some external support from specialists in this area to ensure that we're getting the best deals that we possibly can. 
Thank you. Can I ask if any members have any other questions they would like to ask? Can I ask if uh, the Chair of the Board and the Auditor General have anything they'd like to add? I think the, the points that I wanted to make from a government's point of view have been made during the discussion. Uh, so, no, thank you. In that case, thank you very much for attending the meeting and we'll have a short suspension while we seat our next uh, witness. Um, I'd like to welcome De Jeff, uh, David Jeffcoat, partner for uh, Alexander Sloan, to the meeting. And uh, there's just a couple of questions, formal questions, to ask you. Uh, one is for completeness and for the official record. Uh, could you confirm that Alexander Sloan has received all the necessary information and explanations that it requires? to form its opinion on the financial statements? 
Um, yes, I can confirm that. Um, I'm able to do a, a, a short summary if you wish as well. Absolutely. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Chair and the committee. Um, I would like to give a summary of our work to accompany our audit opinion and our audit summary report. Alexander Sloan was appointed to carry out the external audit of the financial statements of Audit Scotland for the year to 31st of March 2022. We commenced our audit planning in January of this year and our audit field work in early May and I signed the audit report on the 6th of June 2022. Our audit was carried out in accordance with international standards on auditing. We carried out our audit remotely using a secure portal to request and receive information electronically and technology such as screen sharing and video calls to make our work uh, as efficient as possible and we thank Audit Scotland's finance team um, for their support on this. Our audit opinion confirms that the financial statements of Audit Scotland give a true and fair view at 31st of March 2022, that they have been properly prepared in accordance with international financial reporting standards and the government's financial reporting manual uh, and in accordance with the Public Finance and Accountability Act 2000. I can confirm that adequate accounting records have been kept uh, and that we've received all the information and explanations we required before issuing the audit opinion. Our audit opinion also confirms that expenditure has been incurred and receipts applied in accordance with the PFA Act 2000. As part of our audit work, we are required to prepare uh, an audit summary report to management and a copy of this is sent to the committee. This report summarises our response to key audit risk areas that require particular focus uh, in an audit and reports on any weaknesses and on, um, in the accounting systems and internal controls that may come to our attention during the audit. Our audit work on management override, in particular in respect of the appropriateness and accuracy of bookkeeping accounting journals, identified no issues to bring to the attention of the committee. Our audit work on revenue recognition considered the accuracy of recording income in the appropriate accounting period and was strongly linked to our auditing of work in progress on audits that had commenced prior to the year end. Our audit work concluded the work in progress debtor balance and creditor balance at 31st of March were based on robust assumptions, were accurately calculated and we are satisfied they are accounted uh, for appropriately in the financial statements. Our audit work on accounting estimates included the consideration of provisions within the financial statements. We are satisfied the provisions contained within the accounts, including the provision for fee rebates, is appropriate. The underlying estimates and, um, are accurately calculated and that sufficient disclosures have been made to aid the users of the financial statements. We are also satisfied the pension provision has been appropriately accounted for in line with the actuaries report but the disclosures are adequately um, detailed in note three of the financial statements um, and that the assumptions used by the actuaries in calculating provision are reasonable. With regards to any recommendations to the accounting systems or financial controls, I can confirm that following <coughs> our audit work, we did not identify any matters we require to raise to the management or committee. Finally, on behalf of me and my team, <coughs> I would like to record our thanks to the staff at Audit Scotland for their helpful and prompt assistance during the audit. Happy to take any questions from members of the committee. Thank, Thank you. you for that and for these reassurances. Um, just one thing we would uh, like your, uh, your uh, assurance on. Accounting judgments require detailed consideration and scrutiny by auditors. And I would ask, ask you on behalf of Alexander Sloan to confirm <coughs> that you're content with the judgments made by Audit Scotland and the disclosure in the annual report and accounts noting that a provision for additional costs in the previous year was overstated by £497,000. Yes, yeah, so the provision that was brought into the accounts last year was based on the information that was available at the time. Um, so in respect of the, uh, that was to do with the um, uh, additional audit fees, uh, that was based on the information that came from the approved auditors at the time, the I think the 25% figure that you talked about earlier. So that was brought into the accounts last year um, based on the information that was there following negotiations during 21-22, uh, that figure then came down. So the effect, the accounting effect of that is basically a credit to that account. So essentially, yes, you uh, end up with a, uh, um, that being over-provided for effectively last year, but uh, it's sort of fixed this year, if you like. To what extent did you look at the 25% additional costs uh, in terms of uh, Audit Scotland's remote audits and how that impacted? So this would have been actually last year's audit where that came into being sort of last year 
to assess the appropriateness of that provision. Well, it's still um, mentioned in this year's it's accounts. It's still mentioned in this year's accounts because we have to disclose any, any comparative information that's in there. So this was looked at last year uh, as part of the audit. Uh, and the reports from the approved auditors were looked at as part of that consideration uh, last year as well. And you were satisfied with uh, those figures and how it was handled? Yes. I mean, I, again, this is last year's audit, but yes, we were satisfied last year. And in respect to the, the substantial additional funds granted by the Scottish Government to Audit Scotland, how did you uh, analyse the disposal? Did you analyse the disposal? Um, Yes, so I think the, the additional funds you're talking about mostly relate to the pension, IAS 19 pension costs of about mm. six million towards not the end of the year. Not just that. I mean, the pension costs we understand, and those are, those are, those are not revenue-related. Mm, yeah, yeah. uh, it's the revenue-related costs that uh, Audit Scotland received in addition, which were, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, fairly close to a record in terms of the size of the increase mm. they received. Yes, yeah, so as part of our audit work, we do consider regularity, which is how expenditure uh, you know, is, is, is spent in, in, in very sort of high-level terms. And we look at the appropriateness um, of expenditure that's incurred. We look at um, any, anything that might be significant as well, anything that looks unusual. We had no concerns with that. You were satisfied as to the deployment of these funds? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask members if they've got any questions? No? Um, do you have anything you'd like to add yourself? No, not at all, no. no. In that case, uh, I think we can perhaps close this meeting at this point. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Scottish Commissioner of Public Audit, thank you.